Debbie Collier's ordinary trip to the family dollar in Clayton, Georgia, took a chilling turn on that fateful Saturday afternoon of September 10th. It was around 3 p.m. when she made her purchase, unaware of the sinister events that were about to unfold. Two hours later, her daughter Amanda Bearden received a text message from Debbie, sent at 3.17 p.m., that would forever haunt her. The message read, They are not going to let me go. Love you. There is a key to the house in the blue flower pot by the door. Little did Amanda know, this would be the last communication she would have with her mother. The following day, a shocking discovery sent shockwaves through the community. Debbie's lifeless body was found at the bottom of a ravine, her clothing stripped away and her remains partially burned. The gruesome scene provided no immediate answers, only fueling the growing mystery surrounding Debbie's untimely demise. The story of Debbie Collier's tragic end had just begun, enveloping the small town in a cloud of uncertainty. What happened to Debbie in those harrowing hours between her last message and the discovery of her body? Who were the ones that wouldn't let her go? As the investigation unfolded, the answers to these questions would reveal a web of secrets and a tale of darkness that no one could have anticipated. A roadside memorial tonight for an Athens mother found naked and burned more than 60 miles away in Habersham County. Who did this? Some people in this area still on edge. I want to set the scene for you first. If you can see, there's some flowers right at the entrance of this turning section. And just beyond me here to this wooded area is where deputies found a 59-year-old mother dead. In the quaint town of Athens, Georgia, resided a vibrant woman named Debbie Collier, who, at 59 years of age, was enjoying the golden years of life with her life partner, Steve, a 67-year-old gentleman. Their love story was nine and a half years strong and encompassed a blended family from their previous relationships. Debbie was the proud mother of Amanda Bearden, a 36-year-old woman, and Jeffrey Bearden, a 33-year-old man. Steve also had two children and was blessed with two grandchildren. However, the tranquility of this blended family was shattered when the local police discovered Debbie's lifeless body at the base of a ravine near Tallulah Falls, Georgia. She was found partially clothed, lying on her back with distressing burn marks on her abdomen, her hand gripping a small tree. Nearby, her abandoned black minivan was spotted, its doors unlocked and eerily empty. The news of Debbie's horrifying demise sent shockwaves through her family and friends, mainly since she had just celebrated a joyous 59th birthday on September 2nd. The last memory of Debbie alive was held by her husband, Steve, who saw her around 9 p.m. on Friday, September 9th, before they bid each other good night and retreated to their separate rooms. The following morning, Steve left the house before 9 a.m. for his job, parking cars for the University of Georgia Bulldog football game. When he left, Debbie's rental car, a sleek black Chrysler Pacifica van, was still parked in the driveway. She had been driving this rental from Enterprise following a minor car accident that had left her own vehicle in need of repairs. Upon his return home, Steve found both Debbie and the minivan missing. He assumed she had embarked on her usual Saturday errand run to fetch groceries and didn't think much of it. However, concern engulfed him when Amanda, his stepdaughter, arrived with unsettling news. She had received a text message from Debbie that was out of character. Following this revelation, Amanda checked her mother's room only to find her purse, credit cards, and driver's license left behind. Alarmed by the unusual circumstances and Debbie's uncharacteristic behavior of leaving the house without her purse, Steve dialed 911 at 6 p.m. to file a missing person report and have the authorities inspect their home. The story of Debbie's last day was about to unfold into a haunting mystery. Athens, Park County, number one. Yes, uh, came on, my wife was at home, her driver's license still in there, the rental car is gone, and her daughter's here, and we were kind of worried about what's happening and where she's at. I was wondering if you could send somebody over here. Okay. Do you have any medical issue? Let's say like Alzheimer's or something like that? Uh, no, no, she's uh, 59 years old. No, she has no medical issues until I guess. And according to her daughter who went up and 
uh, her purse is still here with her driver's license. The only thing is the phone is gone, and she sent her daughter a text about two hours ago saying, they won't let me go. Whatever that means, we don't know. And I've been gone all day parking cars for the football game, and, all, and that's where we're at. In the wake of the mysterious phone call, a police officer promptly materialized on Steve's doorstep. Steve and Amanda, united in their confusion and worry, retold their tale of Debbie's inexplicable vanishing act. Amanda unfurled the enigmatic messages she had received from Debbie, adding a layer of intrigue to the unfolding drama. Two particularly puzzling texts stood out. The first was a digital breadcrumb via Venmo, revealing a startling monetary transfer of $23.85 from Debbie to Amanda. The second, a cryptic message that sent chills down their spines, read, They are not going to let me go. Love you. There is a key to the house inside the blue flower pot by the door. After receiving this chilling communique, Amanda had tried relentlessly to reach Debbie, her calls echoing unanswered in the void. On the morning of September 11th, Amanda found herself making repeated calls to the athens Clarkey County Police Station, the mystery of Debbie's disappearance deepening with each unanswered question. Um, hi, um, my name's Amanda Bearden, and um, I saw a missing persons report on my mother last night, okay. or yesterday, excuse me, and I was just wondering if maybe I could speak with the detective that's been assigned to her case. Okay, do you have any further information? I sure do. Um, I mean, do you want do you want the case number? Okay, I mean, I have the case number so I can look it up that way. Um, bear with me just a second. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. Okay, yes, um, yes, ma'am. Okay, and the detective may not actually be in the building yet, so I, I may have to get you a patrol officer. Okay, so just bear with me just a second. And what kind of update do you have? Just so I know what to try to. Oh no, I. I I'm sorry, I didn't mean like I had an update, I just meant, oh my god, I didn't mean, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm i not in a clear mental state, I, I'm just my okay. mother that's missing. Um, I just I just wanted to talk to them, I wanted to see if maybe there was something that I could do, I do have the rental agreement number if they needed that, um, I mean that's the only thing that I, I have to offer, so maybe because she was in a rental car, I do have her rental agreement number. If they could maybe trace the GPS in it. Okay. I'm her daughter. Yes, ma'am. Take a deep breath for me, okay? I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. I'd be upset too. I completely understand that part, like being upset about it. Um, so the officer that took your report is already gone for the day. Um, he worked last night. And then the detectives, I don't think they're in the building right now. They're kind of working on an on-call basis, so I don't know that I can get in touch with them and, unless I have something, you know, fresh to give them. And that would be something. But I can see if I can get another officer to call you back, okay? Okay. Um, um, we've got the bolo out for her. Like, we got everybody, you know, keeping their eyes peeled for her and that kind of thing. So, um, um, I, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck here or anything, but do I need to hire a private maybe because I, I I mean and I'm not trying to be ugly or anything but it, 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 I don't understand why some I mean I, I know you don't know everything of course but why it hasn't what I've asked being done like why isn't the GPS in your van being traced do I do I need a private detective to do that I mean I just I don't I'm not trying to be ugly or anything. I know. I, I know. just, the most help. Okay, so here's the thing. She's, she's an like, what, what is she? She's an adult. I right. got it. So, that makes things a little more difficult because people are allowed to leave and go and do things without telling other people. And I know that's not a good answer. I understand that. But that is also, you know, that is also part of it because she is an adult. So it just, it just takes some time also to do these things. And so I don't, I don't specifically know what they've done yet or not. I wasn't here last night, so I don't know. But um, I, from my understanding, they would be doing everything that we know to do currently. But I will definitely get somebody to call you back, okay? Okay, thank you for talking to me. I, I, it's no problem, ma'am. I'm so sorry. I, I hate that this is happening to you. What was your name again, sweetie? 
Amanda Bearden. Amanda Bearden. Spell your last name. B E A R D E N. Okay. All right. I'll get somebody to call you back here shortly, okay? Thank you so much. Right, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Hi, can I speak with Colonel Johnson? Okay, I don't have a Colonel Johnson. Okay, um, he he just called me. Um, I I just I had some more information for him, and I I just I wanted to get it to him. Um, my name's Amanda Bearden. Okay, okay, all right. Hold on one second. I talked to you earlier, so uh, it was uh, yes, Sergeant Johnson. We had you talk to. Hold on, Sergeant Johnson. I'm okay. sorry, honey. No, that's okay. Um. There's lots of Johnsons around here, so I want to make sure I got the right uh, one. I get it. <laughs> um, you just need him to call oh, you back? Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I just I thought about it, and I have her iCloud. Working together with Amanda, Diane Shirley, Debbie's sister, who resides in Alabama, got in contact with the athens Clark County Police Department to obtain information regarding the puzzling vanishing of her sister. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Diane Shirley. And my sister uh, lives in Georgia, and my niece told me she was missing. Her name is Deborah Collier, or she could go by Debbie. Okay. And, and I'm wondering if y'all have any information about it. <clears throat> as far as, I mean, no, no, not other than with the officer or whoever is working on the case, I, I don't know anything. Um, where, was she, where does she live, do you know? Um, all I know is Athens. I'm sorry. I don't know her, her address. Collier? Okay. C O S I E R? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have any information. Um, you know, when there's something, they will they will contact the family um, whenever they, like I said, whenever they have something for that. Okay. All right. We're just not getting. Information, so I'm, I'm just. Yeah, I'm sorry about I'm that. Just, I am really worried about my sister. Okay. And. You know what she? I, I, you have any information where she might go, or you have anything to add? Well, to it, my, or? from from my niece, she said that mm -hmm. she was in an act about a month ago, and she was, you know, on the road. She was following this truck, and this truck lost a paint can. And the paint can hit my sister's car, and the paint went everywhere. And the driver was trying to convince my sister not to tell the cops that he was driving because he was out on parole, and there was, you know, a stipulation to his parole that he couldn't drive. I guess. Do you, do you think my, that? Do you think that? My, was, I'm sorry. I was going to ask. Do you think that was told to anybody else? Well, uh, do you think that was told to I, the officer? That, that concern? That standing from my niece. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if the officer knows that, but I can have him call you um, if you want to pass it along with really him. Anything to help, you know? Yes, I would really appreciate that. Yeah, that's what right I'm in Alabama. I'm sorry, go ahead. I I'm in Alabama, and, you know, I, I, I'm really too... She won't, you know, she's not communicating very well with us, and I really would like to know what's going on. I got you. Yeah, since you, I mean, since you may have insight on that, let me, I'll have the sergeant give you a call. Is that okay? Yes, sir. That would be wonderful. Approximately two hours following Amanda's final call to the police station, investigators successfully pinpointed the location of Debbie's rental vehicle by utilizing data from Sirius XM radio. The vehicle was identified northbound on Georgia State Route 15 near Tallulah Falls, Georgia. A representative from Sirius XM had liaised with the Athens police, providing information about the vehicle's position. The representative suggested the minivan was either stationary or pulled over. The vehicle was discovered roughly 60 miles away from Debbie's Athens residence. Sergeant Ethan Neal of Habersham County was alerted by the 911 dispatch about the rental car's location, prompting him to navigate toward it. He requested the assistance of Officer Dakota Foster from the Tallulah Falls Police Department at the scene. Upon the vehicle's discovery, Sergeant Neal informed a Habersham County detective that he believed he had noticed the identical vehicle parked at the exact location around 5 p.m. the previous day. 
The vehicle's make and license plate had yet to be reported to law enforcement at the time, so they were unaware they should be on the lookout for it. The van was found deserted and unlocked. The police informed Debbie's family about the discovery of the rental car, leading Amanda to rush to the scene. She instantly identified the car as her mother's, vocally asserting that it belonged to Debbie. Investigators proceeded to question Amanda about her mother and the potential reasons she would abandon the vehicle. Amanda explained that her mother had no history of mental illness or suicidal tendencies. She suggested that due to a bad back, Debbie would not have been able to venture far from the vehicle on foot. The arrival of the Habersham County K-9 unit instigated a search of the nearby wooded area. An officer discovered a red tote bag placed on its side near an uprooted tree, which had remnants of a fire at its base. Further inspection revealed a partially burnt blue tarpaulin next to the partially unclothed body of a woman lying on her back and gripping a small tree with her right hand. The body bore burn marks on the abdomen and was described as charred by the officer. The body was swiftly identified as Debbie Collier. At 3.06 p.m., Sergeant Neal declared the crime scene. Following the initial investigation, Debbie's body was transported to the Bureau of Investigation's crime lab. Other evidence collected at the scene included Debbie's purse and cell phone. The finding of the purse raised questions, as Steve had mentioned in his initial 911 call, that Amanda found her mother's purse, including her credit cards, at the house. With the recovery of Debbie's body, the investigation transitioned from a missing persons case to a homicide investigation. Law enforcement began working on search warrants and subpoenas for family members. They started gathering information to piece together the events from Debbie's last known whereabouts until the discovery of her body. Steve's alibi of working from 9 a.m. until 4 p.m. was verified. Traffic cameras near the Tallulah Falls School recorded Debbie's rental car on the highway around 2.17 p.m. on September 10. Surveillance footage from a family dollar store in Clayton, Georgia, showed Debbie entering the store around 2.54 p.m. and exiting at 3.09 p.m. The camera above the cash register captured Debbie, purchasing a blue tarpaulin, a lighter, a tote bag, and a rain poncho, items that were found at the crime scene. Debbie appeared calm and exhibited no signs of distress in the video footage. She was seen wearing a red outfit, including a Georgia Bulldogs football jersey. Debbie was seen sitting in the minivan for approximately 10 minutes after returning to her vehicle. At 3.19 p.m., she drove away. It is speculated that Debbie sent the cryptic text to Amanda and initiated the Venmo transaction during this time frame. Despite the video showing Debbie purchasing items that were later found at the crime scene, Jeffrey, Debbie's son, expressed doubts about the woman in the video being his mother. He had several concerns, including her posture and the question of why she was in Clayton, especially given the proximity of a Dollar General to their home, which she frequently visited. The police had minimal information regarding any potential suspects or findings apart from the surveillance video. However, news investigators uncovered some potential evidence and clues related to the case. On September 21st, 10 days after Debbie's body was discovered, the New York Post reported that they spoke with a neighbor of Steve and Debbie. The neighbor alleged hearing a disturbance at the house on the Friday night before Debbie's disappearance. In the quiet murmurings of the neighborhood, one voice stood out, There's a visitor who comes calling on the weekends and evenings. The sound of their raucous disputes is unmistakable. This visitor, a young woman, was believed by many to be Amanda, Debbie's daughter. Amanda, a figure known to the law due to her history of domestic disputes with her live-in boyfriend, Andrew Geigerich, was recently a resident of Maryland, living near her brother, Jeffrey. Just before Debbie's mysterious disappearance, Amanda relocated to Georgia with Andrew. Jeffrey, candid as ever, expressed his distrust of his sister's companions, stating, I have no doubts about my sister's love for our mother. She was our mother's lifeline. However, the company she keeps gives me pause, and therein lies my concern. Days later, as Fox News reporters scoured the crime scene, they unearthed an uncanny discovery. A bullet, unfired, lying in wait some 20 or 30 yards away. 
This evidence was promptly handed over to the investigators. In the chilling aftermath, 19 days after Debbie's body was found, Sheriff Joey Terrell of Habersham held a press conference alongside investigator George Kaysen. They shared information and fielded questions, but refrained from divulging specific details to avoid tipping off potential suspects or jeopardizing the case. The autopsy on Debbie's remains was still pending, but the burn marks that marred her abdomen pointed to foul play. The police were clear in their belief. Debbie's demise was an act of murder, deliberate, personal, and far from random. The internet was quick to cast a suspicious eye on Amanda and Andrew, especially given that Debbie's last text was about sending money to Amanda. Not to mention, Amanda's move to Georgia coincided with Debbie's disappearance and her previous run-ins with the law over domestic violence. But it wasn't just their tumultuous past that cast a shadow of doubt. Andrew, who had previously accused Amanda of stealing money for drugs, also had a restraining order against him. His criminal record was marred with a misdemeanor DUI, reckless driving, possession of marijuana, and domestic violence against Amanda. Amanda, on her part, had been arrested for battery, falsifying a drug test, and making a false police report, accusing Andrew of breaking into their shared home. A fearful Amanda and Andrew vehemently denied any involvement in Debbie's death. Andrew confessed to a news reporter, We sleep barricaded behind our doors because we didn't have anything to do with this. We're scared, just trying to protect ourselves. Meanwhile, Jeffrey, Debbie's son, pleaded for peace and respect amidst the swirling accusations over Debbie's death. He lamented, The public has decimated any chance of a normal grieving process for my family. For that, I'm not sure I'll ever forgive. I implore you, lay down your weapons and stop hunting my family. In a powerful plea for privacy and respect, he took to social media expressing his concerns, particularly regarding those in charge of his mother's case. On Wednesday, October 26th, he shared a poignant Facebook post about a disturbing exchange with Sheriff Joey Terrell. I made the poor decision today to reach out to Habersham County Law Enforcement. After several attempts and requests to be brought up to date on any information shared regarding my mother's case, I finally found myself on the phone with the Habersham County Sheriff Joey Terrell to express my concerns. My goal in the conversation was to request to be updated on any press briefings, releases, or other pertinent information since my other attempts were not panning out as promised. I met with a sheriff who did not empathize with my situation, my concerns for my personal and family safety, after being doxxed online or potential leaks coming out of his office despite several media outlets claiming sources within that department. He instead used his time to snicker and laugh at my attempts to discuss my concerns and to tell me directly that he wasn't trying to hang up on me when pressing him on his office's actions. Additionally, he claimed that some of their errors regarding poor communication came from short staffing. But he did remind me that the press has the right to free speech. Well, so do I. So, I feel compelled to share my experience with the sheriff because I hung up on him abruptly after he continued to snicker despite my request for him not to laugh at my situation. Unfortunately, the elected sheriff's attitude and lack of understanding does not give me faith or confidence in their ability to handle her deliberate and personal death, nor does his inability to understand my concerns regarding the leaks of information that I only assume is known by those directly working with the investigation. I am no longer feeling emboldened. Now I'm feeling really stuck in a hard place, and I'm asking for the Internet's help in this situation to remind me how much people actually care and love for my mother, Debbie Collier. In the aftermath of his impassioned plea on Facebook, Jeffrey returned to the digital sphere on Saturday, October 29th, with a video imploring cyber citizens for assistance. His message to Debbie's unknown assailant was crystal clear, My pursuit of justice will not wane until you're behind bars or awaiting your fate on death row. As the autumnal leaves of October began to fall, new evidence presented itself, causing the detectives to question whether this was a tale of murder or a tragic case of suicide. The law enforcement's reasoning behind this shift in hypothesis remains shrouded in mystery. From the get-go, Amanda, the daughter of Debbie Collier, found herself tangled in a web of suspicion. The accusatory fingers of her own family 
directed the investigator's attention toward her, suggesting she was the potential perpetrator of Debbie's demise. Amanda candidly revealed, Out of nowhere, a family member branded me a murderer, and the next thing I knew, I was sitting in the back of a police car, being whisked away for questioning. I complied voluntarily. A grueling interrogation ensued, spearheaded by a fiery, red-headed investigator who didn't mince words when accusing Amanda of murdering her mother. Unfazed, Amanda stood firm in her innocence, offering to surrender her DNA, sans legal representation, as proof. The day following her intense questioning, the police arrived at her doorstep armed with a search warrant to which she willingly provided her DNA. She also mentioned that Andrew followed suit. Even as she found herself under the relentless scrutiny of investigators, Amanda bore no resentment. She comprehended the necessity of their relentless tactics. Just before Debbie's memorial service, approximately six weeks after her untimely departure, Amanda had a clandestine meeting with the investigators. The outcome of this meeting mended her relationship with the law enforcement. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation reassured her that she was no longer a person of interest in their investigation. In regards to the $2,385 that Debbie had transferred via Venmo, Amanda disclosed that the police initially froze her account. However, once she was exonerated, she regained access to her funds. While Amanda's removal from the suspect list has yet to be formally announced, her strained relationships with most family members, fueled by their belief in her involvement in Debbie's death, are evident. On November 18th, the Habersham County Sheriff's investigators concluded through a press release that Debbie's death was, in fact, a suicide. The press release stated that a thorough analysis of all the evidence led them to the conclusion that Mrs. Collier's death was self-inflicted. The cause of death, as determined by the GBI Medical Examiner's Office, was due to the inhalation of superheated gases, thermal injuries, and hydrocodone intoxication. Before revealing the case details, the Habersham County Sheriff's Office investigators sat down with the family, leaving them in a state of limbo, bereft of any information to provide them solace or clarity about their loved one's fate. Throughout the investigation of Debbie's demise, familial bonds were tested and strained at a time when unity and support were most needed. With the truth of Debbie's death now unveiled, one can only hope for healing and reconciliation especially for Amanda, who bore the brunt of the ordeal.